Many teachers are feeling demoralized at work and are now leaving the profession. Oh great, those handful of teachers who realize that the system sucks are walking away, leaving the brainwashed true believers in charge. I'm Dr. Duke and she's Katie and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we discuss how objective journalism is dead, especially when Harvard students claim it endangers illegal immigrants. Plus, college students prove just how poor their education has been when they are asked to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. It goes about as bad as you'd think. But we start with public school teachers admitting that the biggest problem they face is not burnout, it's demoralization from all of the high stakes testing, the administrative turnover, ever-changing curriculum that frustrates their students, and the fact that they, you know, can actually be teachers. But before we kick things off, we are blessed in a country of great bounty. But every great country and all great bounty has moments of lapse, right? There's always problems. Things always come up. To avoid that kind of a chaos, here's one thing you should do. You really ought to build yourself an emergency food supply. A couple weeks, a couple of months, six months of food in, stored away someplace nice, and you're going to be sitting pretty. I trust the people at My Patriot Supply, and you ought to as well. A two-week food kit gets you started. Try this. It's a, this week alone, you're going to save 40% when you visit preparewithduke.com. That's preparewithduke.com. These kits include breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They last up to 25 years and are guaranteed to arrive in two days. You and I have thought about this many times, Katie. What we need now is prepared meals for emergencies for our dogs, okay? We think this is a great idea. Tell me what you think at home. Let the people at My Patriot Supply know. What if we actually push them to create preparation supplies for our pets? It's one thing for us to have something to eat for two weeks, six months, but what about our dogs and cats? What if we had veterinarian grade My Patriot Supply supplies for our cats and dogs in the worst circumstances? Send us a note about what you think about that and we'll let them know at the store. All right, on to our first story. Teachers feel demoralized and frustrated. And so what's happening here? what we could have predicted was happening. One of the things we said about Common Core really early on was whatever else it was, it was a way to deprofessionalize teachers. It was a way to push teachers into the background, to script classes for them, to, uh, to politicize classrooms in ways that they really didn't have a lot of room to navigate, to create tests that forced them to teach to tests, that took away all incentive to be creative teachers, uh, to be teachers who really were compassionate and caring, it really damped all that down. And so now these teachers are not tired of teaching necessarily. They're not angry at their profession. They're not even burned out. They're just completely demoralized because they, they don't get to be teachers. I can't think of anything more frustrating than to find your vocation, to get into your vocation, and then to be told that you're not allowed to do it the way you were called to do it. Oh, absolutely. And I have my own personal experience of coming back late and wanting to come in, knowing how much harder it would be because of the things about that they, they used to call it burnout, and it's not burnout anymore because they're finally admitting the truth of what it is, that the, the current teachers that we have, like you said, it's a passion thing. They got into it, and that's why I decided, okay, I'm going to go in, and I know it's going to be hard, but it, it there just reaches a point at when do you say enough is enough? I'm not even making any impact. You know, they even say, like, with, with the burnout, if you make – you know, impact that one child. They can't even do that anymore because they're not allowed. They're so strapped down of what they can do. It is demoralizing. Look, and we, we talk a lot about education and teachers, but a, a, a committed, competent teacher is worth her weight in gold. We know that. That much more influential on a kid's educational development than almost anything can be a really concerned teacher who knows what she's doing. The problem is this demoralization at the heart of it is teachers really realizing that there's been a boundary put, a boundary, a, a wall put between them and their kids, and a distance, right? Absolutely. And this is a, one anecdotal case is this um, Chrissy Romano Arabito. She uh, writes for Ed Surge. She's a columnist, but she spent 27 years in the classroom teaching everything from first grade to middle school in New Jersey. And while she was teaching middle school a few years ago, she began to basically feel this pressure, this squeeze about how high stakes testing, you know, and, and what have they have to do. Plus there was administrative uh, turnover, there was battles over the curriculum and how much scripting is being done. It's not teachers teaching, it's teachers reading scripts, essentially. Um, and so 
27 years in the classroom, all of a sudden she's being told she has to do all these things. It was making it hard for her to like actually be a teacher and do good work. And it really was kind of just draining her in this love of teaching. She says, I did get to a point where I saw that the kids were coming in and their love of reading and writing was just slowly going out the door. They were just coming in and sitting down, reluctantly opening up their books. But I felt the same way. Yeah, reading under all of this federalized, incentivized programming now, reading is not a joy. Reading is not a a window into other worlds. Reading is not a a voyage of discovery anymore. It's a chore. Mm -hmm. Just like math is a drudgery now to these kids. It's like Dickens' novel Hard Times, Mr. Gradgrind, slowly chewing these kids into conformity. What Dickens warned us about in the middle of the Victorian period, 1850, has now come back in spades in the way we educate kids. And you're, you were trained as a teacher recently. You know what we're talking about here, that we're grooming young teachers. Now, these, the, uh, what I said at the opening and the tease for this is exactly right. These are the teachers that know how it used to be. These are the teachers who know what it takes to actually connect with a kid. We've got a whole generation of teachers below that that were never trained in this way. And what I discovered is being, I wasn't obviously a teacher back then, but I'm a little bit older than my peers were. And I at least understood that my teachers, the teachers I had, were of that era. So they understood of how teaching actually worked and what it meant to be. I can name all my teachers from K through 12 and what they meant to me and how I became inspired to be an educator. But the students who I was around, my peers, came from that latter generation where all of a sudden there was that twist and mm, Common Core came around at that same time or No Child Left Behind. All of that was happening as I was getting out of the school And I think you need to comment before this segment's done a little bit because I watched you when you were going through it. You were in my classes while you were going through your education courses. And the scary thing about this is these are the teachers with consciences. These are the teachers who understood what teaching was. You've got a generation of teachers now, 30 and below, who know none of that. These are automatons. These are drones, right? Absolutely. This is what the school systems want. They want drones. And that's what you were seeing when you were going through your your teaching licensure program. And and, in one of the very last, it was the very last assignment of one of the classes that just repeated itself multiculturalism and all of that with it was supposed to be about american education and the history of american education the last assignment reflection paper of course that we had to do was writing about why teaching was a profession how we are professionals and i was the only person in the class to completely rip it apart because they're not professionals what they used to be you know, what they were supposed to be is teachers to educate and inspire. Instead, they are literally being handed these scripts. I've seen the scripts of what, here's what you have to say to them. Okay, and now they're going to do their math problems. Or now they're going to look at a book. They don't even look at books. A passage of a book through a certain lens. That's what the teachers, future teachers, are being told to do. And again... They're not reading books. They get a passage from a book, a 300-page book, they get two paragraphs. They don't even bother with the context or where the book came from, where the passage came from. They decide they're going to look at this two paragraphs ripped out of a book. We're going to read that from Marxist lenses or feminist lenses. In other words, it's an exercise, an absolute agitprop that if you're a real teacher offends you. If you're one of these drone teachers we've plugged in now, you don't know any better. And that's the tragedy of American public schools. Yeah, we are at the point where it's that whole generation switch we 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 can't hold on to these teachers anymore because they've all now turned into what these kids already had of of being basically automated that's why fixing this is going to be a major under it's almost unfixable in the public schools you'd almost have to tear them down and start over yeah and so what we're seeing is you know people say oh teachers are retiring well it's not that they're just leaving they're not you used to be oh you're a teacher how long have you been a teacher 25 30 35 years and then they would retire it's Two years, and then I went and decided to work anywhere else, in HR somewhere. I can't tell you how many teachers I met across the country on my Common Core tour for about six years. Can't tell you how many teachers I, who I met who had 10 years, 12 years, 8 years, 15 yeah. years left. They got their 20 years in, but they got 10, 12. They wanted to work 10, 12, 15 more. Nah, They took their pensions and they left early. They got out of there after 20 years, despite their hearts wanting to do it for another 20, because they could not, just couldn't stand the way, the uneducational way the educators were supposed to behave now. Yeah, and the one last point I want to make on this story uh, is the influence and the responsibility of the administration and what's happening with there. It's not just the teachers. It's all this turnover that's happening in administration at all these schools. There's nothing... I, unfortunately, my beloved, I, I call him, um, 
district administrator just passed away and he I had done a big speech on him in high school because he was kind of like a grandfather in a way because he knew every kid he he was in the profession for a reason and at our school alone he was there for 25 years look at how many administrators you have in schools today how long have they been there and how long will they be there and what are they actually doing while they're there well we, this, this segment is getting longer and longer but this is such a major issue in, for america right now and what's happening now is we've made teaching un, un palatable we've made the classroom un sufficient for actual teachers. We have poisoned the classroom for people who know and want to teach. So what's the, the, what is all they have open to them? They either walk away or they do administration. Oh, yeah. So they're all bumping up. The administration is even more meaningless than the classroom, but they get paid a lot more, right? So you either walk away or you sell yourself out to the administrators where you make a godly, ungodly amount of money programming other kids to destroy the classroom. That's exactly what's happening. And uh, we know that that's happening in terms of what's happening, like in the K through 12 system, and then it bleeds over into, we know, the college system. And as we know, our college kids are not learning anything, including the Pledge of Allegiance. So stick around for that story. But first, we're gonna go to Harvard, which is supposed to be the creme de la creme. You know, they're an Ivy League. And yet, the students who are there act like babies. We actually have a story back in November uh, that talked about what was happening with the Harvard Crimson. It's the student newspaper. And they had 50 Harvard students protesting them outside of the building, demanding that the Harvard Crimson, the student newspaper, stop doing objective journalism, not subjective, yep. objective journalism, which repeats itself. That's just journalism. It's just supposed to be. <laughs> but uh, they basically, the Harvard Crimson has had trouble throughout this entire semester because what happened is they provided balance coverage about an anti-ICE, the Immigration Customs uh, Enforcement, protest. All they did was they sent a reporter to cover both sides of what this anti-ICE protest was doing. And for even asking an ICE agent for a comment, these students got outraged at the newspaper. Yeah, and they actually said that reporting objectively on ICE on the immigration problem in this country is danger endangering illegal immigrants. By telling the actual true story about what ICE is up against, about how illegal immigration has problems and creates all sorts of issues for communities. It's by the talking about, to, just to simply mention those things, mm -hmm. now according to the progressive left at Harvard, that endangers illegal aliens. And so what you have to do is you have to go to a completely subjective journal. What they're calling for, whether they know it or not, is a completely subjective journalism that parrots liberal talking points. And I, I have a maxim. The more prestigious the university in this country, the more infantilized the students. Oh, and yeah. Harvard, Harvard screams this. Yes, right. Absolutely. The more prestige, the more the university has given itself over to this kind of nonsense. It's like they're riding on the coattails of the reputation. We're Harvard. We'll always be Harvard. So it doesn't matter if the last three generation of Harvard graduates were uneducated morons with uh, extremely expanded social consciences and very l uh, limited ability to think critically, because that's what they're getting out of these schools. And I'm actually, as a former college editor, uh, a little proud of the two <clears throat> editors who just actually wrote a piece defending themselves mm -hmm. and basically putting on blast these student protesters. The editors for the Crimson said, the Crimson exists because of a belief that an uninformed campus would be a poorer one. You know who also said that? John Adams. Anyway, that our readers have the right to be informed about the place where they live, work, and study. In pursuit of that goal, we seek to follow a commonly accepted set of journalistic standards similar to those followed by professional news organizations, big and small. At least used to be, not anymore. Use. Yeah, that's the key. <clears throat> Foremost among those standards is the belief that every party named in a story has a right to comment or contest criticism leveled against them. And that's exactly what they were doing, getting both mm -hmm. sides of it. That's why our reporters always make every effort to contact the individuals and institutions we write about, administrators, students, alumni, campus organizations, and yes, government agencies, ICE. Uh, before any story goes to press, we believe that this is the best way to ensure the integrity, fairness, and accuracy of our reporting. This is Journalism 101, and these protesters have no idea. Well, and let me be very blunt. We've done enough stories from the Harvard Crimson over to the last know, couple yes. of years to know that they, that they do it in name only, right? That they pay lip service very often to that. In the article in question, it's not like ICE really got it, was given an equal, equal yes. a forum. They weren't. ICE was thrown in there because they had to do their due diligence, right? But at least they did. But at least due, they yeah. did it. And that is a not, is, that's a 
a bridge too far for these idiot Harvard protesters. So we're, we'll see what happens when they return to campus next next semester. But we know what's happening on uh, a lot of campuses, especially any of the campuses in California, where uh, we get the joy to to see what they don't know. And uh, this week we saw Austin Fletcher of Fleckus Talks. So he's better known as Fleckus Talks, but Austin's a good guy. And he actually, this fall, went to the USC campus and asked very simply, hey, do you know the Pledge of Allegiance? And of course, this is what they offered. Do you know the Pledge of Allegiance? No, I'm not. Definitely not. <laughs> what? I mean, when I was a kid, yeah, sure. I pledge allegiance to America and one nation under God, indivisible for the youth, for service, justice, and for all or something like that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Oh my gosh, did I forget? Did I forget it? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America under one... Wow, this is embarrassing. It's all good. Look it up. Well, yeah, on the one level, I suppose the last place you would learn the Pledge of Allegiance is college, right? Yeah. I don't ever remember having a, anybody at the, the universities I attended say, hey, let's make sure you know the pledge. That's something you should have known by the time you got to college, right? That's something that should have been part of your mother's milk growing up. It's something that should have been uh, something that little kids in first and second grade learned how to do, right? But of course, our classrooms are such contentious places of political agitation. They're such quasi-Marxist incubation factories that the last thing we're going to teach young kids is anything that has to do to promote the idea of America as a just or a virtuous country, one deserving of our respect. I guarantee you, they'll teach these kids how to kneel before they teach them what the pledge is uh, in American public schools. The fact that there isn't an American flag in every public school is outrageous to me. And the answer is, is because some people might be offended by the American flag. Yeah, you know what? Some people are offended by truth, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but I'm not. And anybody offended by those values needs to shut up or move along. Stop brainwashing our kids this way. And so you get a bunch of uh, brain, largely brain-dead college kids in the University of California campus who, who have no idea, right? And, and all I'm going to say about this is while it's not the responsibility of the universities to take time out to teach our kids the Pledge of Allegiance, the fact that they don't know it furthers the university agenda of turning them into ignorant anti-American morons. And I found it very telling that uh, a lot of what they did, first off, the pledge is 31 words, right? Most of these kids, if you asked them what their Starbucks order is, it would be more than 31 words. Um, but a lot of them said instead of indivi or in indivisible, they said individual. In the way a lot of them, if you watch the full video, it, it's that's the most commonly held up word for them. And instead of knowing it's indivisible, that's exactly uh, what we are, is divided, right. and, and it, it's individual. You are exactly right that the kinds of responses they gave were all, um, significant about certain aspects of our cultural rot. What they did and don't remember, uh, the kind of attitudes they took, the things that did stick in their mind, show you really uh, how badly misinformed in terms of the way this country functions, government, civic, governance, civic, civics, civic responsibility, all those things, uh, we, they're just gone. And we've replaced them all again with, with gerrymandered social justice theory ideology, where America's always wrong, uh, and you see it in how, how this affects our culture with the, 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 um, re this last weekend when you've got all of these idiots supporting Iran. I mean, how can you call yourself a liberal progressive and then weep bitter tears that one of the biggest murderers of black and brown skinned people in the Middle East was obliterated? How can you take the, like Rose McGowan ah. or um, Michael Moore, how can you actually write open letters to the government of Iran apologizing, right, for the murder of this thug who was in Iraq in a military capacity helping to undermine the security of the Iraqi and the American occupation there. How can you, how can you take the side of those people so blindly? Some of this stems from the fact that growing up, you're never taught the differences between how things work. Multiculturalism, like you got a steady diet of, insists that all cultures are the same. They're not, right? And refusing to teach kids the difference between free democratic Republican societies and theocracies or socialist enclaves or third world tin pot tyrants, right? Not drawing a clean line between the differences in those two types of government leads to this kind of mis misguided nonsense we see today. If only they would have had their 31 words. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And that will wrap it up for this Hump Day episode. If you would like to support this program, please consider joining our Patriot Club for $25 a month. Visit drdukeshow.com to get started. And I'd like to thank my Patriot Supply for sponsoring today's episode. If you have a business, large or small, we'd love to partner with you. We will say the Pledge of Allegiance for your product. Visit freedomproject.com slash advertise, freedomproject.com slash advertise to learn more. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And until next time, stay educated, my friends.